Hi, my name is Raghu Govinda Chari. In this video, we will discuss the use of finite state machines for embedded software. Specifically, we will look at the advantages of state machines as a thinking tool on modeling the behavior of the system. We will also use it as an implementation tool and discuss the best practices for the same. Embedded systems are reactive systems in the sense that they are meant to respond to external signals in a bounded time. Therefore, the embedded software are structured to act on the external events immediately for registering the event, processing it, and responding with outputs if any. What exactly is the nature of the relationship between the input and the output determines how the embedded system software or hardware are structured. Consider the Metro Turnstile control system. Its basic functionality is to keep the turnstile locked unless a valid token is recognized by it or an override button is enabled, usually from the supervisor's counter. If we consider a token as an event with parameters, i.e. all the information stored on it, then the turnstile does not need any more information internally or externally to make its decision. So its operation is purely combinatorial. Such systems are also called stateless systems. For example, the HTTP server that serves web pages is a stateless system as each HTTP transaction is independent of any earlier interactions between the client and the server. Stateless systems improve the properties of visibility, reliability, and scalability. Visibility is improved because a monitoring system does not have to look beyond a single request in order to determine its full nature. Reliability is improved because it eases the task of recovering from partial failures without having to revert to previous states. Scalability is improved because not having to store state session information between requests allows the server to quickly free resources or be migrated to a standby system. Contrast this with an FTP server. It has the notion of a session where the client needs to log in and authenticate first before any transfer can take place. Further, FTP commands may cause navigation of directories on the server before initiating transfers. While web applications can appear to be stateless, it's only a matter of whether the state is part of the server or the client. In reality, all applications require the notion of state in order to perform meaningful functionality, unless the functionality is almost trivial. Stateless embedded applications are suited for any actions that are transitory. For example, since the turnstile at the metro station has only a direct action of locking or unlocking based entirely on token and manual override button inputs, it can be considered as a stateless system. In the rest of this video, we will look at stateful systems because they can exhibit more complex, realistic and useful behavior than stateless systems. Let's now look at another example, a trivial car safety warning system. The requirements are very simple here. Actually, there are two requirements. First is, if the safety belt is not worn when the car is moving, then an alarm should sound. Similarly, if the handbrake is engaged and the car is moving, then the alarm should be sounded. These can be seen as a simple set of rules and one can implement them using a combinatorial logic. A naive and direct code for implementing would code the rules as a set of conditional statements using if then else structure one for each requirement. Obviously, that's quite unusual and no programmer would do that. A better approach would be to do a K-map reduction, but K-map reduction is possible only for binary values. In reality, the parameter values may not be binary. Yet another approach is to look for patterns in the input-output relation. We immediately see that when the car is not moving, the alarm will not be triggered irrespective of the input values. If it is indeed moving, then we can see that the alarm is triggered as logical or of the seat belt not being worn and the handbrake is being locked. So a simpler code would be like shown here. For the simple set of rules we have, it's easy to arrive at the code above. Most implementations start this way, but then as the requirements grow, the above starts degrading. For example, we may add more requirements such as we want the passenger seat also to be checked for belt status and the presence or absence of a passenger 
has to be detected by another sensor and it becomes one of the inputs. So that number of inputs increases, then the combinations on the number of rows of the table will exponentially increase. Therefore, coding that and trying to simplify that like we have done in this case is going to be complex. Now let's extend the requirements for the car safety warning system a little bit. Let's say we say that it's exactly the same as before, except that once the alarm is triggered, it can be turned off only when the offending condition is rectified. Note that it means just stopping the car won't disable the alarm, but one has to uh, either wear the seat belt or remove the handbrake. Only then the alarm will, will sound, even though the trigger condition was only when the car was moving. But once the alarm is triggered, we want it to continue till the actual cause is rectified. So the code for that is shown on the right side. Now we have initial trigger condition in the if statement here, which is similar to earlier. So the flag alarm is either initially false and then when the trigger condition that car is moving and either the seat belt is not worn or the handbrake is locked, then the alarm uh, flag becomes true. And if the alarm is true, we will trigger the alarm. But then to keep the alarm ringing until the trigger is more removed, that is when the car is stopped also, you need the while loop here. While alarm is true and then the condition remains the same, the alarm will continue to ring. Otherwise, the alarm will become false. So it is stopping the audible alarm at that point. Now, what's important here is not the use of while loop per se, but the fact that the condition now includes the alarm as, an, as a control variable. Basically, what we are saying is that not only the input variables, that is, the seat belt status or the handbrake status, but also the alarm status is becoming an input to the behavior of the system. So it's essentially a feedback of the previous state into the current state. So we are already talking about states. So this is a sequential logic, not a combinatorial logic because there is a feedback of the output as an input again. So the input is alone not determining the output, but the input along with the past output is determining the new output. Such logic is called sequential logic. So we will talk more about sequential logic in terms of state machines. What we are interested is to model the behavior of the system. And then we can actually see if the model is performing as per the requirements which is basically traceability to the requirement. And the model can lead to an implementation and one can trace the implementation to the model. The usefulness of the model comes in the sense that it can be used to evaluate the behavior under all possible conditions and check that it meets all the requirements and doesn't do anything which is contrary to the requirements. To do that, the, the first step is to identify the objects of interest in the system whose behavior we are trying to model. And the behavior itself has to be defined in some formal, uh, formal specification or formal language or a diagrammatic way. And then look at the interaction between objects, not just the objects in, in isolation. And then see if those interactions influence the behavior of other objects and vice versa. So this is basically the intention of modeling the system so that before even implementing, we can have a proper understanding of the requirement, translate it into a formal model, and the model can be a reference for implementation. Let's now look at yet another example uh, problem statement, which is very common in any uh, electronic product. So there is a mechanical switch which the, is meant for the user to uh, operate the product and typically being mechanical switches with springs and whatnot, uh, when you press it, it actually doesn't give a stable signal immediately. It's called bouncing. 
So the picture on the right shows that when you when it and the but button is pressed, it's supposed to show a high voltage, which is five volts in this case. Instead of being a straight five volt for the duration of it being pressed, which is basically the contact is closed, it's showing a lot of transitions from five volts to zero volts and vice versa. So basically it's now looking like a pulsed waveform instead of a flat line. This causes a lot of problems for the system. First of all, knowing whether it's a zero or one is an issue. The other issue is that if it is connected to an interrupt line, it can generate multiple interrupts and can cause confusion to the system. So it's, in, it's typically uh, debounced. What do you mean by debounce is to make it either a low only or a high only from the given input, which is a fluctuating low and high. It's typically done in hardware to some extent, basically using an RC filter. It can also be done in software uh, because the RC constant should match the bouncing duration for which you need to actually uh, have data on how long the button bounces. The problem with that is that this can change with time. As the product gets older, this can become loose and cause a longer uh, bounce than the hardware circuit may not be effective. On the other hand, a software circuit can be adapted to the as aging product. So it's desirable to have a software solution as well. Unlike the RC filter solution, the software solution must work in the discrete digital domain. Uh, the RC filter is an analog domain solution, whereas the software can only deal with digital uh, data. So let's take a close look at the bouncing pulses in the figure on the right. By experimentation, we know that for this particular switch, a single press of the button can generate a burst of pulses for about 20 milliseconds. The state of the contact within this duration is immaterial. Instead, the state of the contact after 20 millisecond delay from the initial contact is what matters, basically for stability. Let's consider that most intuitive software approach to debounce. When you look at the pulse signal of the button, you can think of it as a noise induced fluctuation in the signal. A simple noise filtering approach is to introduce a hysteresis loop such that it delays the response to the noise sufficiently to smooth out the signal. In effect, it acts as a low pass filter, removing high frequency transitions. Let's look at one of the most popular approaches to implementing software debouncing logic. The code is shown on the right side. It's basically not a function, but directly is there in a loop. And the loop is continuously polling the button uh, logic level. If it detects a change in the level, it records the timestamp of the level change into the last debounce time in lines 34 and 35 of the code. It evaluates if at present sufficient time has elapsed since the last level change instance. If so, it deems the current level to be stable enough to be output in lines 37 and 38. As you can see, it's a very simple logic based on detecting transitions in the logic level and looking for stable signal over a pre predefined interval. This is one of the most common implementations for the debouncing logic. Note that the loop is continuously polling for the button logic level to be read. In reality, an interrupt service routine will supply this logic level only when the button is pressed or released, including the bounce. Still, the code can compute the elapsed time since last transition. Now, let's look at another implementation which converts the elapsed time into a counter. It also has some coding tricks which may make it efficient but tricky to comprehend. A debouncing logic will be uh, heavily used, especially because the button will be used by the user and it has to take least amount of CPU time. So a lot of people implement it with a lot of hacks. Here is one example of a hack solution. Here the function debounce switch 2 gets called regularly by a timer tick or similar scheduling mechanism, basically polling for the button. It shifts the current raw value of this switch into a variable named state. Assuming the contacts return zero 
or low for a closed switch condition, the routine returns false till a dozen sequential closures are detected. One bit of cleverness lurks in the algorithm. As long as the switch isn't pressed, number one shifts through the variable named state. It's, there's a left shift operation in line 12. Because of the bitwise or with negation of raw key pressed value, the least significant bit of the state will be one. And hence the state a comparison with F000 hexa in line 14 will always be false. So it returns correctly the output false or low for the unpressed button state. But when the button is kept pressed, because of the bounce, sometimes raw key pressed will high and sometimes it is low. But eventually when the last high is followed by lows, that is in the stable state, the digit one will reach the most significant bit and will make the state F000, therefore returning true. Clearly, uh, there is a mask 0x e uh, 000, which is basically to make the highest bit don't care condition. Anyway, this code, the intention of showing this code is that uh, people do clever tricks, but more importantly, it's a counting solution where uh, the number of counts up to 12 is uh, required always to determine if uh, the key is pressed as one or high. So it is similar to the previous one, except that in this encoding, uh, assumptions about how many, how long you want to uh, evaluate the logic level is embedded into the code deeply. This is not a good idea, but it's, it just shows that uh, because of the efficiency expected, people do this. We saw two direct implementations for the uh, debouncing logic. And we know that in one case, it was pretty obvious what the logic was. And in the other case, it was a bit obscure. However, uh, from a design point of view, we would like to model the behavior of debouncing software formally in order to prove that uh, the logic works. In many systems, especially in safety critical systems, provenance is important and therefore a model is useful for that rather than the code itself. Because one can never prove the code, but one can only inspect the code, review it. But on the other hand, formal models can be uh, formally proven. So let's look at the state machine model for the same. Here, there is a dot which shows the you know, initial state typically used in reset. From there, automatically it transitions to the default state, which is waiting for a key, key press. Now there is a transition event called tick E because for every timer tick, it is considered as a transition. The transition has in the square bracket some condition. It's a Boolean expression. Here it's shown as button port greater than zero. What it means is that this transition is guarded by a variable called button port and a condition on that variable being greater than one, uh, zero, which is basically logic high. So if the logic is high at the timer tick, then it moves to the detected state. That is logic high is detected. Otherwise it stays in the waiting state. So the, the convention here is that a transition event is labeled not only with the event label, but also with the guard condition. Only if the guard expression evaluates to true, the transition happens. Otherwise, the transition doesn't happen and the system stays in the current state. Now, once it is in the detected state, there are a few things that happen inside. First of all, a variable called count is initialized and uh, then the current event, which is basically the button press logic high or low is saved. And then there is a do statement, which basically says that uh, it's incrementing the count. So as long as it is remaining in the state, for every tick, the counter will be increased. 
Then there is a transition out of this state detected to the state wait for release. This happens when the counter eventually becomes higher than the minimum button count, which is a, a default uh, for the threshold. So that after that many counts subsequently, it's considered a stable input. So it goes to the wait for release. So we have detected a press event. If there were the press level was seen for at least min button count duration. On the other hand, if the trans, there is a transition from the high level to the low level, it goes back to the waiting state. So it back, back to square one. So again, the whole process repeats. So the counter gets reset. So once it's in the wait for release event, when the button input becomes low, then it's signaling a release. It goes to the update state. The update state is a transitory state because all it does is produce the output, the logic level detected as high, and then it, it basically resets the variables which are used in earlier. So it, without, without any logic, it directly goes to the waiting state. So it's a transitory state introduced. Why do we need the transitory state? The one thing to notice is that the states, inside the states, you have actions. There are two types of state machine uh, models, basically the Moore machine and the Mealy machine. The Moore machine, in the Moore machine, all action happens while it is in the state. And in the Mealy machine, actions are uh, initiated only during the transitions. So in this being a Moore machine, all the actions of reinitializing, etc., are done basically cleanup operation before it goes to the waiting state again from the update state. Now, one other observation is that the labelless transition is happening at the same instance, the, the transitory state. So it is not taking any other tick here. So it's basically a immediate action. Uh, so at the current tick itself, there are two transitions. To summarize, a state machine can perform actions upon entry, exit, or while residing in a state. An important point to note is that the state chart above is a model of the behavior of an object such as a debouncing switch. As a model, it expresses the logic very succinctly and clearly instead of the code because the code can be implemented in many ways and is not always readable by others, as we saw in the earlier example. For example, we saw a hack code which was efficient but difficult to understand. For a simple problem like debouncing, implementing a state machine in a literal way may be an overkill or inefficient. But as a behavior model, it's an excellent one to reason about. One can analyze the state machine in abstract and find any bugs such as a miss, missing transition or boundary condition, etc., without having to pour through someone's code. Better still, such state machines can be executed in abstract using simulators to ensure state coverage, reachability, and potential deadlocks. Best of all, such a state chart can even be an input to a code generated tool that will churn out implementation code either in software or even as hardware, for example, using Verilog or VHDL. Earlier, we stated that the future behavior of the system depends solely on its present state and the current input, not the entire history. Let's elaborate on that a little bit. Let's consider a simple state machine typically used in peer-to-peer -peer protocols, connection-oriented protocols. So the protocol state machine is there on both sides, the peer entity side and this uh, local uh, device. They both are initially in the init state and they enter connected state either by initiation from the peer entity or by the local entity. Once in connected state, they are eligible to do data transfer or disconnect 
if no data is there to be transmitted. And once data transfer starts, it's in the data transfer state. Again, from the data transfer state, it can disconnect. This connection puts it into init state. So it's a very commonly used uh, protocol state machine. Looking at it closely, the, the memoryless property is exhibited by the fact that when it's in the connected state, it doesn't know whether it entered the connection state by its own initiation of connection request or by the uh, initiation by the peer. Similarly, when it's in the data transfer state, it doesn't matter whether it was initiated by the peer as a data receiving on this side or as a data transmission initiated by the self entity. What matters for the transitions is this current state and the nature of the event. So a disconnection event happening in connected state or the data transfer state puts it back into init state. So it doesn't matter how the connected state or data transfer state were entered. Let's recall the debouncing state machine discussed in the previous slide. There we saw that a variable named button count was used to track whether the button level is remaining high long enough. If the system behavior is based on several such variables, then the relationship between the control variables and the output action becomes intractable. But there are many cases like here, such a variable is required. Normal state machines or pure state machines do not have a concept of variables, conditional variables. They only have a state variable. On the contrary, we need the such variables like count in certain cases. Let's see how that is used effectively. Let's revisit the debouncing state machine that we saw earlier. On the right side, you saw, see the exact same diagram wherein a counter variable is used. In that, in each epoch, when the newly read button level is same as the previous level, that is no level J, then it stays in the same state up to a min button count times, after which it goes to the wait state for it goes to wait at the release state. Upon the first level change, it goes out to waiting state. So in the absence of a count variable, this can only be expressed by so many internal states as shown in the figure on the left. Basically, for each, uh, each epoch, it moves from one internal state to the other until it reaches the min button count uh, state. And the next epoch, when the level remains same, it moves out to an external state called wait for release. So there are two types of states, internal state and external state. The usefulness of internal state is just to count or keep pace with whatever the delay is expected for holding the current level. So one can model it this way without a variable. But then obviously, if the variable, uh, the limit is very high, like min button count is 100, you need to introduce artificially 100 internal states, which serve no purpose. Now, on the other hand, having a variable captures that same semantics very effectively. However, when not used judiciously, conditional transitions can result in spaghetti code due to the if statements required to code to check for transition guard conditions. So if you look at it as a code, the transition or the tick event, there is a condition called the count button count is greater than min button count. This if condition has to be checked. Now you can have many such conditions and then it becomes a spaghetti code. So this, these conditions are called God conditions and they have to be used very selectively, if at all. One of the issues with using guards and conditional variables is that they have to be reinitialized when state transitions occur. For example, 
the button count needs to be reset when transitioning out of the detected state and needs to be initialized when entering into the detected state again. The code required for implementing this tends to be complex and often an extra overhead for state transitions, especially when they are transitory states. Also, this code is scattered all around in the logic and therefore one may uh, miss out on the initialization causing problems. So the downside to using such variables is what is called coupling between qualitative and quantitative state transitions. We will see shortly what it means. Basically internal states are quantitative and external state are qualitative because the internal state don't contribute to a change in behavior of the system or observable behavior of the system. The internal transitions up to min button count is the quantitative transition. They do not cause transition to another state, but only changes the value of the uh, variable. Thus, these transitions do not alter, alter the behavior of the state machine qualitatively. On the other hand, a transition that leads to another external state is qualitative as it affects the future behavior of the system. To illustrate the difference between the two, let us take another example. A state machine with variables and guard conditions is called an extended state machine. Now, the variables are quantitative information, states are qualitative information. So let's understand that with an artificial example. So the figure on the right side shows a so-called state machine model for the state of water. We know that water can exist in one of three states, namely solid, such as ice, liquid, and gas, such as steam. We also use superheated steam state where the steam has no water droplets at all in this example. As we know from high school physics, the change of state from solid, liquid, or gas is called phase transition and is achieved by heating or cooling until the melting point or freezing point or boiling point or condensing point is crossed. Until these boundary conditions are reached, heating or cooling may increase or decrease the temperature of the ice, water or steam respectively, but not change its state per se. A phase transition is a qualitative change in the sense that the substance, that is water here, undergoes significant change in its property, physical properties and exhibits completely different behavior as a solid, a liquid, or a gas. On the other hand, other responses to heating or cooling does not cause such a change in behavior. It just increases the internal temperature. This is just an analogy, but from embedded system modeling point of view, it provides a good guidance on what is a qualitative state transition and what is quantitative state transition. To repeat, Quantitative state transitions do not alter the external behavior of the system until a boundary condition is achieved. On the other hand, a qualitative state transition alters the behavior of the system by moving from one state to another. After all, the very purpose of having distinct states is to codify or encapsulate a different uh, mode of behavior. A word of caution on usage of cards and condition variables in modeling uh, using state machines. Conditional variables and cards are powerful in expressing complex behavior without adding a lot of states and complexity to the state machine model. However, unrestrained use of conditional variables can cause coding issues. Variables have to be reinitialized upon entry and exit of states one may forget that because initialization and exit and entry may be at different places in the code. Normal states and transitions are statically defined. Basically, uh, while designing, we know what the states are, what the state transitions are, which is captured in a state transition diagram or table. However, variables modify this behavior dynamically at runtime. Therefore, a statically defined model can be uh, verified using uh, formal methods or using tools or simulators 
But when you have variables which modify the behavior using God conditions, it becomes runtime validation. So it is more complex as opposed to a static validation that can be done using uh, traditional state machines. So it is when you use conditional variables and gods, it makes it hard to analyze the correctness properties of the state machines. Let's revisit the car safety warning example once again. Earlier, we said that this is not a purely combinatorial logic, but is sequential because the output depends not only on the inputs, but also on the current state of the system. Let's try to model it as a state machine. Initially, upon reset, we enter a safe state of the car in which it is moving and the seat belt and handbrake status are initialized to on and unlocked. However, the system may detect very soon that either the seat belt is not worn or the handbrake is locked or both. So the corresponding transitions of the seat belt not worn takes it to unsafe SB state. Similarly, the handbrake locked event takes it to unsafe HB state in the diagram. From there, they can transition to unsafe state where both seat belt is not worn and handbrake is locked, is detected. This state machine introduces three different unsafe states to distinguish between only seat belt is not worn, only handbrake is locked, and both seat belt is not worn and handbrake is locked conditions. This is required because we have the requirement that only when the offending condition is removed, the alarm will stop. So having a single unsafe state with an either or condition cannot be used. In, it is clear that having such conditions cause state spirit, space explosion and complexity of understanding the behavior of such complex state machines, especially when the number of states and transitions are high. We will now look at a modeling technique to control the complexity of models such as this. One of the formal techniques to control complexity is composing complex state machines from simpler ones. Another way to approach it is decomposing a complex state machine into simpler parts and finding the relationships between them. Formally, a state machine is expressed as a set of set of states S, a set of input events I, a set of outputs O, and a set of update functions UF. In the figure, we have two state machines, SA and SB, arranged in series. It's called cascade composition, which means the output of state machine A is fed as input to state machine B where for a specific instance of input xa, if the first state machine produces an output ya, it then becomes the input for the next state machine. Remember, this is happening synchronously in the same clock or in the same instance or epoch. So the effective output you see yb is influenced by the ya. So it's a composite behavior. Now, basically, if you look at cascading, what, become, what is the state space that we are looking at? The actual states of the composite state machine is a Cartesian product of the states of A and states of B. So you get pairs of states, one from the state machine A and state machine B. So each pair represents a unique state of the composite machine. And then, Similarly, the initial states can be defined uh, as a pair of the initial state of A and initial state of B. The update functions can be defined similarly for the n plus one epoch in terms of the nth epoch uh, output or update function of both state machines A and B and so on. So how is this useful? By looking at this previous example, where we were having substates of unsafe, basically to represent the handbrake status and the uh, seatbelt status. One can start with separate state machines 
and then see how they can be combined. Okay, uh, looking at the composite state machine, on the left side, we have the earlier state machine representing the car safety system, where the unsafe state is broken down into three substates. Unsafe because of uh, seat belt not being on, unsafe because of uh, handbrake being engaged, and unsafe because both of them are uh, both of them are true. On the right side, you see the composition uh, model of the same. So the unsafe state is encompassing two different state machines internally. The SB1, basically SB1 and SB2 are states of the safety belt uh, as an object. And similarly, HB1 and HB2 are representing the state of the handbrake. And the transitions there are very trivial. So when it's engaged or locked or unlocked, there is a transition. Now, from the safe state, when the event seat belt off arrives into the composite state machine, it triggers internal transitions of SB1 and S or SB1 or SB2. Now, it also is available to the other state machine. So remember, now we have a Cartesian product. So the new state can be a combination of, uh, we have four combinations here. This state transition is det determined by the new event from the set of four states. Similarly, any other transition like handbrake is locked or unlocked, all that happens on the uh, composite state. But the way it is analyzed is by feeding this input to the individual state machines and then composing their uh, new state as well as any output function that they will perform. If the new state happens to represent a transition to safe state, that is automatically achieved. So basically, when alarm is stopped, when the original condition which caused it, basically seat belt was off, when the new event seat belt on happens, it will be basically uh, taking it to the safe state. Similarly, the handbrake case. Now, if both were true, it will not take because of one signal, but it will actually take two signals. So basically, internal transitions happen when only one of the two conditions are, are arrived. And only when both conditions arrive, it trans transits to the safe state. So essentially, it is equivalent to the one on the left, but it is expressed in a much more uh, separated way with the formalism. So this simplifies analysis of behavior by enumerating states systematically and relating inputs and outputs in a well-defined way. So on the left side also, it is the same. However, you have to do it uh, consciously, manually, and it's prone to mistake. Here you're doing it systematically because you know it is a formal uh, Cartesian product and then the transitions are applied according to rules. Of course, when it comes to implementation, one can use either form. In practice, the form on the left side is generated from the specification on the right hand side. So far, we looked at state machines as a modeling tool. But when it comes to implementation, uh, especially when you are manually coding it, there are some choices. We know that automata theory shows the equivalence of sequential programs with state machines. And state machines can be implemented by sequential code. Now in this model, states and events are discriminators to evaluate the state machine at every epoch. How is that implemented? A nested if then else on the state and event um, variables is a common technique for simple state machines. But when the number of states and uh, you know number of events combination is very high, then the code is spanning multiple pages and it's very difficult for somebody to uh, you know read and understand that. Of course, one can implement using nested switch statement as opposed to if then else slightly better because 
it basically partitions the conditions to mutually exclusive ones. This is assuming that switch cases don't fall through. So a nested switch is typically used. Again, the two discriminators are the state variable and the event uh, uh, input. So you have two nested, uh, one internal switch, one external switch. One can organize it, uh, the outer one as state based and the inner one as event based or vice versa. It's typically left to the implementer's uh, judgment. An alternative to using code, which is basically if then else or switch, is to use a data driven approach, basically state transition tables. Uh, so the matrix, um, basically the number of states and the number of uh, events. So it's a M by N matrix, where M is the number of states, represents the rows and the, or it can be columns, <coughs> and the events are the rows. The cells of the table hold the next state. So it basically that captures the state transition. However, you need more than transitions. You need actually action. So some function has to be executed. Again, depending on the type of uh, state machine, whether it's a melee machine or more machine, when the function will be invoked is uh, left to the implementation. <coughs> but typically, a state table is implemented as a table of pointers to function. And the function itself can update the state. So one can have a separate update function or merge the action function and update, uh, update function. But it's better to separate the two. An update function happens only once when you transition into that state, whereas the action function can happen on entry, exit, or while in that state. So table of pointers, function pointers, is a very practical way of implementing it from a readability point of view. However, in a state machine, there may be a lot of uh, empty cells. Basically, the combination of state and event may not have any meaning. Such an event is not expected to come in that state or no action needs to be taken, no update has to be done, etc. So those entries are basically uh, invalid or null entries. So in the function pointer implementation, one has to call then you know one has to check if it is null then don't call a function or one has to put a dummy function and then do nothing there which is an overhead more importantly it wastes space basically it's a sparse matrix and therefore it wastes space so one can use uh, sparse matrix representation techniques to reduce the uh, you know the storage requirement but then that will increase the search requirement Fortunately, uh, state machine implementations will have current state as a variable. So what one has to search for is the event types, you know, in a linked list or in an array for that state. So, but that's well understood how state sparse matrix can be represented and navigated. However, if you don't use sparse matrix, you get a constant time invocation, which is good uh, for embedded systems because the execution time or at least the invocation time is uh, constant. To summarize, we started with combinatorial logic as with the Metro turn style system, but realized that those are useful for simple functionality alone and can be represented using decision tables. We then discovered that when the output is also an input to the logic, it becomes sequential logic. Thus sequential logic have memory. But we also learned that memory can be restricted to the last instance and not the entire lifetime history of the system. This is exactly what state machine models achieve. However, state machines can become complex without using variables as with extended state machines. Such variables can then be used as guards for transition triggers. Using guard condition variables require discipline and minimalism or else we may end up with mistakes or complex spaghetti code. Finally, we learned about substates and composition of simpler state machines into complex state machines using formalism. 
Formal methods help us to evaluate state machine models for correctness and completeness with respect to the requirements. They can also help in generating code for implementation. Generated code has the advantage of automatic traceability to the model and the requirements. This is important for safety critical systems where provenance is expected. Want to become a software engineer at Google? You can, like thousands of our students. You just need to learn from those who've already cleared FANG interviews. At Interview Kickstart, our interview prep courses are developed and taught live by 150 plus instructors from tier one companies like Google and Facebook. Our courses are tailored to help you crack software engineering domain interviews, including backend, full stack, machine learning, embedded systems, data science, and more. To learn more, book your free webinar slot today 